Beginning January 1st, 2020, the recreational use of cannabis will be legal in the state of Illinois. Available to stream now, my mini doc dives into the history of Illinois legalization, starting with... January 1st, what should we expect? The biggest thing that we need people to understand is that January 1, in terms of the criminal justice system here in this state, is the end of prohibition. See how Illinois missed its chance at real cannabis reform with key failures, including the fact that the program includes regulation on possession limits. So people can still be arrested for a possession. And I want to highlight that in its first year of legalized recreational marijuana in the state of Illinois, they arrested three times as many black people for possession than any other race. We've run into so much cannabis. We've run out of places to put it. I have represented people and taken their cases through the court system who got charged with more serious crimes only because the police said that they smelled cannabis. And not because the police said you have illegal cannabis, or not because you have too much cannabis, or not because you're high on cannabis, mm -hmm. but because I can smell it and that's it. Attorney goes, he understands that he can't be smoking and his cannabis flower shouldn't be open. And I was like, I'd like to say for the record that I was not smoking and my flower was not open. So uh, that's where we're at right now in Illinois. Yeah. And I hope it changes. Start watching now at colememo.com slash minidoc. Hello and welcome everybody and hello and welcome Scott and Reese. Now, Scott, this is your first time on the Cole memo, but it's not the first time we've talked on a podcast. So I'm going to let Reese right. go ahead uh, sure. and introduce himself first and then I'll let you uh, reintroduce yourself. So Reese, welcome to the Cole memo. Thanks for sitting down with me. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And if you don't mind, uh, could you go ahead and just, uh, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself and, uh, you know, a, a little bit about your cannabis operation here in Illinois? Sure. Uh, my name is Reese Xavier. I am CEO and managing partner of HT23 uh, Growers, uh, Custom Crafters, but we uh, DBA as um, HT23 Growers. Uh, we have a facility in Chicago Heights that we're looking to operationalize, uh, hopefully in the near future. Um, we obtained a cultivation license, a craft grow license back in 21, June 21, July 21. And, um, uh, yeah, that's me. Awesome. Scott. Uh, thanks for having me, Cole. Thanks for having Reese as well. Uh, I'm Scott Redman. I'm a, an attorney here in uh, Chicago and have uh, been involved in cannabis since 2019. And, um, have been uh, one of the founders, or am one of the founders of a successful craft grow, infuser, and transport um, company. And also back in 2020, <clears throat> when the licenses were being delayed, I saw a need for advocacy on behalf of the craft growers specifically, um, and uh, formed the Illinois Independent Craft Growers Association as, uh, as a result. And I'm happy to say that uh, Reese was uh, one of our first uh, board members to uh, say, yeah, let's do this. And he's been a valuable part of the organization since then. Um, I, also, I also have, as I said, it was on a successful craft grow team and our brand is uh, Sweet Buzz by Dre Cisco Farms. And uh, it's out in over hundred stores as we speak here. So um, we've got two perspectives. Not that they're different, but uh, Reese is still working on getting himself operational, like so many of our members. <clears throat> and our group has uh, been successful in getting operational um, in large part through self self funding, which it, it makes a big difference. Yeah. And what was uh, what was the website for Sweet Buzz if people want to get connected? Uh, GetSweetBuzz.com. Perfect. And, and Reese, your brand is Savior. Sa Savior. You oh, you're, mute. your... you're yeah, muted, you're uh, uh, Reese. Um, okay, while you're... Yeah, there you go. All right. Yeah. So we were fortunate enough to, so just a little bit more background. Like I, I got involved in the cannabis industry here in Illinois right around 2016. And that was basically going around, attending every cannabis event possible, um, learning from, 
from folks like Chicago Normal, uh, Illinois Women in Cannabis, and, and the valuable resources that and people that I've met through those organizations and others, um, and started building relationships with folks throughout Illinois in the cannabis space. One of the relationships that I've had uh, enabled us to um, start and launch a brand in Missouri. Uh, so, so we launched Savor, our flagship um, edible brand. Uh, we launched that uh, last year and we're looking to launch it here in Illinois. And our website requires a lot of help. So we're still in the process of getting things moving there. Sweet. But it looks like if people want to maybe connect uh, ht23growers.com, yeah. um, we'll have both those links in the show notes, folks. I'm displaying the websites right now. Uh, Sweet Buzz, man, that's a beautiful website. Um, so uh, we come together today uh, because I recently created, I say recently, I, I actually recently published it. I think I, on LinkedIn, I think I actually published it almost like eight months ago on um, Instagram. But, uh, you know, I felt like you both, uh, and you aren't, you two are not the only ones by any means, uh, but you both had some really good feedback uh, on the reel. So I don't know. I thought maybe that's that's a place to start because uh, I feel like it is a conversation about maybe about how this debate is depicted. Um, do you want to start there or, or how, how did you want to start? I kind of pitch it to you all. Um do you think that's a good place to start since that? Yeah, kind of I think it gives some, Scott, your thoughts, but I think it gives a, a little more context to the, to the course of this dialogue. Yeah. 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 Would it be prudent to play it? It's only a minute and 30 seconds. Do it. Okay, sure. cool. I will play it and then we will open the floor. Street billion. Start that. I'm a cannabis industry billionaire and you know what? I'm pretty fucking pissed off about these hemp operators. You see, I've established a firm regulatory foothold within several nascent cannabis markets across these United States. And these motherfuckers think they can just come in and sell weed too? I'm sorry, but that's not how pay to play works. I'm focused on one thing and one thing only. Cash money, bitch. We poured at least 600K into lobbying in one state alone in order to ensure we would have no competition. And then progressives like Donald Trump and Mitch McConnell want to come in and pull the rug out from under us? We're working alongside organizations like Smart Approaches to Marijuana and the Drug Enforcement Administration to close what we're calling a loophole, what some are calling an opportunity. Here's the thing. We believe in limited opportunity. In case you haven't figured it out yet, the limitations are what bring in the cash money, bitch. Oh! The best part of all of this? We have the community's full support on waging this new offensive. We've learned that if we push stories in the media, the community will do the legwork and secure our market for us. We've successfully framed an opportunity as an attack on social equity. Thank you for helping to increase the size of my regulatory moat. Don't let the gators get you. Check out my work at the. So that's that's the real, and I want to give you both the floor uh, after having played it. Oh shit! Go ahead, Reese. Yeah, I, I'm I'm happy to start. Um, you know, I I looked at it as very satirical, um, but it didn't. I I was. It felt to me that it didn't paint. The complete picture. Uh, hemp, in and of itself, is a twenty-eight billion dollar industry. Well, I have to imagine the the same way as depicted these uh, billionaire uh, cannabis folks. There's also the billionaire hemp folks, right? And I, I don't think you know the satirical piece, and I accept it for what it is. Uh, does not paint a complete picture. And I thought it'd be a great space to have this conversation to kind of uh, round out the photo, round out that image and picture and really talk about um, cannabis from the perspective of social equity as well, where uh, the opportunities aren't as great and sometimes the opportunities are limited. And more specifically, uh, states like Illinois has at the very minimum attempted to open a door to... Um, uh, people of color to participate in the industry, a, a well-regulated, um, costly endeavor, but having the opportunity to participate um, 
you know, has the potential to open a lot of doors for a lot of people of color and um, opportunity to communities of color. Yeah, I, and I would add, um, it's, it's um, the messaging, um, your, your video um, is, is really a byproduct and a result of the messaging that's been put out there that, that this is big cannabis against these poor help, you know, helpless hemp businesses. And um, certainly there are, there, big cannabis is, is involved. Um, but if, if, the market were to go to hell, you know, today, the the big cannabis guys would still still be out there. They'd survive. They have such a toehold, particularly in Illinois, that um, that COVID gave them, that the delay in licensing gave them the opportunity to really get um, to get firmly firmly established here in the adult use market. But they would they would be around. Um, it is the the real problem that that we see. Uh, from the hemp industry, and and let's 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 be real clear. There's there's multiple parts to the hemp industry, and and the the castration of that industry goes back you know almost a hundred years um, when the oil industry got started feeling very uneasy about this product, and the textile industry started feeling really uneasy about this product, and everything just got tossed into the to to being illegal um so there is a textile component to this there is a a um, oil and and fuel um aspect of hemp that the farm bill if you ask most people involved and look at the legislative history that was what was trying to be unleashed mm -hmm. in connection with um the farm bill of 2018 CBD, you know, there's also health benefits and CBD was thought of, and that's why a byproduct that has less than the appropriate percentage of THC can, can still be produced and sold. But what's happened is that science has gotten the better of, of things and people have figured out ways to synthesize CBD and other cannabinoids into intoxicating cannabinoids. So that's really what we're talking about here is is the intoxicating cannabinoids that are being um, used um, as an alternative to cannabis. And I, and I even hesitate when I say the word cannabis because it is in fact cannabis, but it's, it's, it's being used in, in replacement or in, in, um, as an alternative, a much cheaper alternative um, to the regulated product that is allowed in the, in the medical and in the adult use states. And for those that don't really understand how we can actually have in a, in a legal, illegal business like cannabis, it's because the federal government has decided that it's not a top priority pursue as long as states, and this is the key, as long as states have a well-regulated um, licensing and, and uh, regulatory enforcement procedures to govern cannabis in their state. And that means heavy regulation, um, heavy security, control of the plant and its and its uh, products from seed to sale. And that means that it's a very expensive business for people to get into. And that's what's happening here is that this business is so expensive to get into that the social equity businesses, largely minority businesses, um, are having a hard time getting up and running because the barrier to entry is so, so high. To, to, to have a, a, the ability to process and, and to grow 5,000 square feet of plants, which sounds like a lot, but in the commercial context, it's really not that much. You have to spend three, four, five million dollars and and there aren't banks that are really willing to lend people that money. There are a few out there, but they only make a few loans. And it's very difficult. And when you have something like hemp, intoxicating cannabinoids, they start taking away market share. And originally the argument was, no, they don't. 
And then the argument was, well, they're not intoxicating. And now the argument is, well, we're too entrenched. And I like to call them canna squatters, right? You got the canna curious, you got the canna attack. They're the canna squatters. They got in the door while someone wasn't paying attention and now they're squatting. And they're saying, you can't kick me out. I'm here. Look at all the good I'm doing. I'm here. I'm employing all these people. Yeah, but you're squatting. And I'll take it a step further. Like, if we look at throughout this nation, what intoxicating product is federally legal with no regulation whatsoever? I can't think of one. I cannot think of one outside of uh, hemp-derived intoxicants. And let's be clear, it is... THC, period. Well, and I, it is. I, yeah, and I think it's important to mention that it, it doesn't have no regulations. It's the only regulation it has is that the Delta 9 percentage doesn't exceed 0.3%. But to your point, but, it doesn't include all the tests. You have to, like, the correct. safety so tests. Right? Even if you look at hemp, even if you look at hemp, right, what they've done to skirt the law is remove the Delta, the, uh, Delta 9 component. Right. Delta 8 is an intoxicant, mm -hmm. right? So even when you're processing a hemp-derived intoxicant, what they basically do is take, when they extract from that hemp, that 0 0.03, which is still under the legal law, right? And then they separate, they, they basically remove the Delta 9, which the law was specific in it. And I think, obviously, I think there was some oversight, you know, that's, that's the nature of technology, and that's the kind of our laws in this country yeah. has never meant to be perfect, right? There, I, I can't think of a law that's 100% perfect. It has some gray areas, and then when you discover the good or the harm that's created by those, the, the, the movement is to close those things, right? At some point in our country, uh, a, a person of color was considered three-fifths of a human. That was just what it was and over time we realized the flaws in that and you you quickly moved to close that right yeah uh yeah. so so the, the the laws in this country are far from perfect but they strive towards perfection yeah. well when this law was created you know i think the thought behind it was let's remove the intoxicated cannabinoids so hemp in and of itself and cbd and the medicinal uh benefits of cbd is good it's not an intoxicant the value of the hemp plant as a, you know, you could do textiles, you could do a bunch of things with the hemp plant in and of, of itself. That's great. That's great for the industry. That's great for the farmers. And I believe the intent was to strip out the intoxicating part. And I think at the time it was just assumed that the only intoxicating cannabinoid was uh, Delta 9. Well, we, we, we know it's not Delta 9 anymore. And quite frankly, I'm willing to bet we will soon discover it's some other intoxicants greater than D8 and D9. Oh, yeah. You know, we, yeah. we, we learn as we go. Um, so, so you know, I, I, I don't think that was the intent. And then I go back to the original question. If you strip the D9 from the product and you're just dealing with D8, D8, which is an intoxicant, I cannot think of one, not one intoxicating product in this country that goes unregulated. Well, and again, I think it just to make the point, it falls under a different set of regulations because, you know, I know a lot of people in Illinois will call these some of these hemp producers unlicensed sellers. It's sort of a misnomer. Uh, I mean, unless they're truly unlicensed under the Hemp Act. What I think oftentimes what people mean by that is they're not licensed under the Cannabis Regulation and Tax Act. Right. Okay, That's fair. Um, so, but, to, and also to your point, they're not subject to the same testing regulations, uh, which are extremely strict and we've detailed it on the show, uh, in the past, they're really hard to comply with, you know, um, what about their distribution channels. Right. And, and I guess just yeah. the point I wanted to make, like, I definitely want to talk about synthetics. Uh, but like, before we get to that, like, I just want to talk about like, you know, you talk about intent and everything and. I am no lawyer, no yeah, Scott, yeah, yeah. You, Scott, you are, um, but I have talked to another lawyer, Scott, maybe you're familiar with them. Um, and candidly, I know some people that disagree with their interpretation, but um, they basically talk about the language in the farm bill and the difference between the 2018 farm bill and the 2014 farm bill. 
and specifically, and it was actually even included. I didn't mean to, uh, but it was included at very, there's a very quick moment. It's included in that reel where it shows Mitch McConnell signing what he called the 2018 um, hemp farming act in 2014. It was called the 2014 industrial hemp farming act. Mm -hmm. So they dropped the term industrial between 2014 and 2018. And they added a subset of cannabinoids, salts, and isomers that I don't know, like to me, like these are cannabinoids that are meant for consumption that are listed and have always been known to be listed for consumption. So I, I don't disagree with you that, I, look, I'm not trying to say here that Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump secretly legalized weed because some people say that and I think that's wild. Yeah. What I think is this is a classic case of legislators not understanding what they're legislating. Yeah. So a point you said earlier about the science, that's that I think that's more part of the synthetic part. But like just down to like the language of the law, it's clear. And a product like this, which is produced by River Bluff, uh, a social equity brand that also makes hemp products, this and actually, frankly, most of the edibles that are produced in Illinois dispensaries qualify as hemp. You know, I mean, they, they would meet that legal definition. Now, could they be sold as it? No, because they've been cultivated and produced under the Cannabis Regulation and Tax Act. But my point is, I just I really want to like set the foundation by like, you know, I know there's this debate about intent on the farm bill, and I think it would be misleading and just frankly false to say that anybody intended to legalize weed with to the 2018 farm bill. Setting that aside, the language is clear. You know what well, I mean? But but and we won't belabor this point because it'll it'll bore people. But they went from industrial to to. And, and took that out because the industrial side is the textile side. The industrial side right, is right. the is the uh, um, oils and and things like that for purposes of fuel. That's the industrial use. Then there is the consumption use. And they added, as you said, a bunch of different um, substances that are allowed because they realize that people can consume aspects of this product for health benefits. But they didn't include intoxicating ones, Craig. That's the point. And that's the point we're talking about here. We're not talking about various isomers and, and non-intoxicating CBD. We're talking about the ones that weren't listed and, and that came in as a loophole. Even the people in the industry recognize it is a loophole. I mean, the majority. There may be people out there that say this was intended, but they are in the far, far minority. Yeah. Uh, you know, so in any event, and 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 we haven't even touched on THCA flower, which is well, just and that's flour. what I was about to say is that's actually the example I was going to use to sort of push back against you because THCA flower, and I've even had Tom Howard on, who is by no means a pro hemper, he's very no. anti hemp, and he's and I don't I've got the clip queued up, we don't have to watch it, but he's pointed out that a lot of the the, the flower and the dispensary could qualify as hemp. You know what I mean? And so, well, yes, of course. I've said the same thing. It's yeah. because you're supposed to be measuring, you should be measuring total THC, which is THCA and THC. There is very little THC in most flour, in, 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 right. in the majority of strains. And that's there's very little THC. That's the point I'm trying to make. And Reese, I'm sorry, your, your mic is actually muted. I had to mute you because when we're talking, sometimes we're getting a little bit of feedback. I'm going to give you the space here, but that is the point I'm trying to make. You're absolutely right that the intoxicating cannabinoids were not listed. Like you just said, Delta-9 is not naturally occurring in the plan at high levels. I think somebody was in the room during the 2018 Farm Bill and they were going, hey, if everybody just shuts the fuck up, well, that could we're going to be able to get this to happen. And you want to, if you want to call it a loophole, you know, I, I get why you would do that. But on well, its face, when you start the sentence, Cole, is if everyone just shuts up, that's that implies right there a loophole that, hey, no one is noticing this. You know what I mean? That I feel like that's indicative. And I, I know that this we could get lost in the whole conversation here, but I just really want to reiterate that I think that's indicative of, of a larger problem in American politics where the yes. le legislators aren't reading the law that they're no, no, passing. They're not. You know, so I get your point. And um, I, I, Reese, I know I was going to pass it over to you here, but I, I like really think that this is there's a really and I'm sure you've heard this one before. So maybe you've already got a response to it. But like, I really do view this as Uber and taxi medallion. And when I look at it through that lens, I actually feel a lot of compassionate for you cannabis operators because you did everything you could 
to follow the rules. And then all of a sudden this, you know, nobody expected the smartphone to allow people to, you know, hail cars to them. We always thought we would be dependent on the cab system. So I get why you're like, what the fuck? We did everything to follow the rules. And then here comes in this like semi-regulated industry, unregulated industry. And it's not perfect either, by the way. There's a lot of issues with Uber, just like there are a, a fair sizable amount of issues with hemp. But that's kind of the way I look at it, where it's like, it's almost like neither side is wrong because you're both providing people a ride. You're both getting people high. It's just like which regulatory system is right. And of course, I think you're going to say the CRTA because you've had to pay these fees and, you know, understandably so. Um, but anyways, I've gone on and on and I promised Reese some space here. Reese. No, no, I, I'll take your example and maybe go a bit a bit sure. further. As I understand it with Uber and the introduction of Uber, it was an industry disruptor. It was not ushered in through the legal process. Now, I could be wrong on that. I think I th what happened. I think that's correct. Yeah. Right. And I think what happened was it, and it took regular the legal regulatory system to kind of rein it in if you will. And that's mm -hmm. the result of your taxis and the medallions, right? They said, hey, wait a minute. Yep. And then they start to rule of reign in, to a certain degree, industry disruptors. This is different. There, well, was, there was not this industry disruption prior to the 2018 Farm Bill, right? right? And we can go down the path of intent. I, I That's a tough one to talk about because no one really knows what the intent. We can go down that path of what was being said in secret rooms um, but we do know what we do know for for certain is there was an attempt to rein in uh, at least one intoxicating cannabinoid. It's spelled out clearly, right? D nine. It's spelled out clearly. That's illegal. We want to make sure it's under point zero three, delta nine THC. Well. We didn't talk about all the other stuff. Maybe they knew about it. Maybe they didn't. We won't go down that path of intent. But I think, I think when you using that analogy with Uber, it's this is not this is much different than an industry disruptor, someone who came up with a different idea to to make life more efficient, and etc. Right. So I, I just wanted to highlight that that point. Um, I also would 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 say again to your point, we kind of talked about this a little earlier. We absolutely did follow the. I think in Illinois specifically, and what you see is starting to be the, the benchmark for new states that introduce cannabis regulation, there is an attempt to usher in um, people of color to participate in this in this potentially lucrative endeavor. Um, I don't think there was a, a recognition of the challenges that it would take to operationalize these businesses. I don't think it was any consideration on what it took to uh, capital receive the capital necessary to stand up the business. Um, but again, to the point, I think we all agree, most of our politicians, um, they have to be educated on certain aspects of industry. And it, and it depends on who's providing that education dictates the outcome of that law. You know, and, until, until the law is enacted and then you start realizing the positive or the negative that happens as a result of it, and then change happens, right? And I think we're in that space right now. Um, yeah. I personally would love to see, listen, at the end of the day, Delta 8 is THC. Let's just be 100% clear about that, right? Yeah. And I, 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 I used to hold this position. If you're going to regulate THC, regulate it the same. Well, Whether, and that that's what I wanted to kind of bring us to like, you know, believe it or not, a lot of people don't believe this. So I'm actually going to show a bio track label, I think for the first time on, on the show for this, the first place I ever tried Delta eight was in Illinois. See this, this is a Delta eight product from grassroots in Litchfield, Illinois. Um, this was in 2019 when I had my medical card and, mm -hmm. um, I guess my point in bringing this up is because Delta eight is often used as like kind of, it's kind of demonized. And personally, I didn't like it. I don't prefer it. I only know one person that does and they only like it because they don't like to get super high. It's an older lady that likes the benefits she gets from cannabis, but doesn't want to get too high. So again, I don't know a lot of people that like it, but I've, I've always just felt like if there are this many concerns about it, then we should subject it to these testing standards that we obviously have in the past. Right. I'll take it. I'll take it a step further beyond just the testing. Right. Our distribution channels, we can't sell. I don't give a fuck how much is tested. I can't sell it in the gas station. 
I, I, I can't put a piece of fruit on my packaging. You understand what I'm saying? I can't put a piece of fruit on my packaging. No one says fruit in and of itself is appealing to children, except for Illinois law. Yeah. Well, and you can't and you can't transport your product to your retail outlets other than in more or less an armored car with two drivers. Two right. Drivers. I mean, that's I, that, that's part of the whole le federal look the other way in terms of legalization. You have to control the product. You have to control the plant. It has to be highly secure, highly safe. And the, and and none of that is part of the the intoxicating cannabinoid industry. Right. Um, and it, is it fair to say that you are kind of operating under a loophole? The coal memo. <laughs> well, the coal. Yeah, the coal. The coal memo. Um, Yes and no. Um, it, it, yes, in a sense, sure, because the federal government has said that it will not, it basically impinge on state rights if a state wants to legalize this and gives it enough control over the over the industry that it will allow the enforcement to to the state. Um, it's it's explicit. So when I when you say loophole. I, I don't want to use the word loophole because it's not explicit um, for the for the uh, Delta eight, et cetera. It's just not there. So by not being there, it's being exploited and 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 pursued. Ours is specifically addressed in in Department of Justice guidelines and and it created the the state industry. Right. And I guess the way that I look at this is like like Reese point brought up earlier, he's not aware of something that's like federally legal but isn't subject to regulation. So what we've basically done with hemp, I feel, is what we did – and you can look at this at the end of the farm bill. At the very end of the 2018 farm bill, scroll all the way down, people. You can see where they descheduled what we arbitrarily defined as hemp. Now, alcohol and tobacco are also descheduled, but to Reese's point – they there are state based regulations for each of these systems and i just want to say as somebody who loves hemp and i'll tell you why i love hemp in a, in a second it's not because i'm in the industry or anything else um but as somebody that like uh, loves hemp i'm all for regulations and that maybe that's how we'll close it's like i think that's where we differ is how how we regulate it if i could quickly and then we'll have that conversation the reason i love hemp again is I made an April Fool's joke. Some people think I, I do sell hemp. That was an April Fool's joke. I, I don't sell hemp. I don't sell cannabis. I don't have any aspirations to get into the cannabis industry, honestly. I've just been a cannabis consumer my entire life. And via what has happened with hemp and the farm bill, I've benefited off of more access to the cannabis plant than any state-based program that I've experienced. And I've been to a few, Colorado, Illinois, and others. And what I mean by that is no purchase limits, no possession limits, uh, no dosage caps. You can get it mailed to your door. You can pay with your credit card. A lot of these things that you might feel are, is unfair, rightfully so, because we should be able to do that with your products too. Um, but anyways, that's why I love hemp. Wanted to get that out of the way. What is the issue with, because we talked about testing and everything else and the fact that these aren't subject to the same testing standards. What you know, There have been proposals by hemp farmers that say, okay, we're not tested. We'll do that. We'll even be taxed at the same rate. How do you, how do you respond to that um, proposal and idea? Go ahead. Again, I'll, I'll take this position. Reg, it's THC. If we can all agree with that, it's THC. It's an intoxicating THC. If we can agree with that, my position is you regulate us the exact thing. Either allow the cannabis industry to sell to children, to sell inside gas stations and anywhere we want, allow us to have packaging that looks like your regular candy, allow our products to get in, in the hands of anybody, or you regulate hemp the exact same way cannabis or you know, legal cannabis is, is regulated in the state of Illinois meaning there are certain testing standards, there's packaging standards, there's distribution standards. Um, security you know, standards. Security standards. 
the exact same. I can only sell my product to a uh, licensed dispensary. I guess my question is like, so all those public safety things, great. And it seems like everybody's on the same page, but all those punitive things that you rightfully have complained about today and people have rightfully complained about in the past, the vault requirements, the security requirements, like why must we treat cannabis like it's nuclear material? It seems like you're doubling down on that system. No, no. What I'm suggesting is regulate us the same. Right. Okay. Now, fair enough. One rule. Change, change the yeah. rules for us. Fair. Yeah. Yeah. If you're willing to do that, okay, change the rules for and us. And I as don't well. think you were serious when you said obviously the kids thing, but uh, I hope you were serious when you said because I truly do believe like. And, you know, this is the question I asked somebody recently. I showed a video. I went into a gas station and there were these really sketchy hemp products that I've never heard about and I wouldn't have bought. But I asked somebody, I said, you know, and they they agreed with me. They're like, I would never, you know, get those. But I asked them this question. And Scott, you pointed this out to me uh, when we had a phone call, I believe. You know, a lot of these big brands, I'm displaying some on my screen right now, Cura Leaf, Cookies, uh, GTI with their Incredibles, they're they're in hemp, not only in the regulated cannabis industry, but like I've gone to smoke shops and I, there's Incredibles on sale. And I'm like, mm -hmm. what? I've seen this in Illinois dispensaries. This is crazy. And so, um, yeah, like like my my question is like, why not just pivot to to that? You know. There's like River Bluff did. No, 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 no. Let's let's get that one straight. River Bluff was a Delta Eight company based in Iowa. Then they got a craft grow license. They didn't pivot to Delta Eight. They pivoted to legal cannabis in Illinois. Kept their Delta Eight operations in Iowa, and now seeing that they can do some of that here in Illinois, they are. So, and and you can have those. They're they're friends. They're members of our association. They're they're kind of straddling the line, but they did start on the on the hemp side um, even and i don't mean to cut you off but even like the order yeah. i feel like doesn't change my point you know what i mean like the order and i, I appreciate you correcting that but i feel like the right. fact that they do it both that's well, what was really my question they, they sure that also proves our point that that it's just far easier to continue down the path or to take up the path either way right Mm -hmm. of of the Delta 8 or the other intoxicating cannabinoid products because you can sell them over the internet, because you don't have all of that security expense. I mean, hundreds of thousands of dollars of security in the production facilities. I mean, literally, I'm not exaggerating. We have to maintain 90 days of video on all these cameras, 100 plus cameras, 90 days of video in the cloud. Do you understand what that costs, that bandwidth costs? thousands and thousands of dollars a month right. they have none of that so I, so the 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 problem with the question you raised is why don't we reduce it for everybody and i don't disagree that would be great but um that's going to take something at the federal level because the things that are being imposed on us are to comply with the mandate of the coal memo which is heavily secure keeping the product out of the illicit market, et cetera, et cetera. And just like, you know, uh, and any other product that's intoxicating, there are, there, there are gutters, you know, there are guardrails to keep it where it wants to be. And, and I will correct you on one thing. There is an, there's a bureau, federal bureau called ATF, right? Mm -hmm. Alcohol, mm -hmm. tobacco, and firearms. It is definitely regulated at the federal level. Don't don't be mistaken there. Alcohol and tobacco are both regulated heavily at the federal level. So that's what is missing. It is is there's they they created potentially an avenue for something that is regulated in almost every other context, but they didn't provide for the 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 groundwork on yeah. on this product. Just and, really. And, just and really just, quick, sorry, Reese, but the the state. I appreciate you adding that the layer of ATF. The state, really, the point with my state thing is that there are some states that have dispensaries for alcohol, but then like states in Illinois, I can go to my local Casey's and get alcohol. That was really yeah, my right. Point. Yeah, sure, for sure. Um, or New ahead, Jersey states, right? But states Casey's, where the also, have is, uh, Casey's yeah. also have to get a license to provide that, sell that. 
right. alcohol, correct? And that license comes from the state of Illinois, which says they have to go through some hurdles and hoops in order to get that license to do it. And let me just clarify, when I said allow us to sell to children, the point was I, I was making was hemp is able to be sold to children. Right. And no one thinks that should be the case. Um, that's And we talked about the order, right? Is the, Why don't we just get inside the hemp business? Right? I think that's kind of was the genesis of this, your question. Yeah. But listen, the barrier to enter hemp is a lot lower than the barrier it is to enter cannabis. If I right. start down the cannabis path, I've invested a lot of money, time, and energy just to get halfway there. Now to pivot and go back to hemp, it's fucking impossible. Had I started with hemp, my barrier to entry is extremely low, and perhaps I can generate some revenue and, and then uh, put me in a position, if I want a license, to be able to stand up that particular license. Who knows? I don't know. But the way we were able to get into the industry was following the rules that were laid out by the state of Illinois. Right? Yeah. And, and this is one of my biggest challenges, especially as a, um, a, a, a person of color who was fortunate enough to, to earn one of the licenses. We followed the rules. Yeah. Can I the try? Were, yep, go ahead try to boil this down like because I know we're getting to the top of our time like it really sounds like what you're saying because it's not it's not impossible for you to pivot to hemp like I talked to David Lakeman and I was like if I got a hemp license today he's like oh you'd be walking out with one this afternoon so like but I know what you meant though like it would be fucking after all the money you've spent yes. paying all yes. these licensing fees setting everything up I get what you mean it would be it would be like but I just, Thank you for that. Yes. Yeah, I just um I still don't understand like why there I just wonder where the middle ground is cuz you all bring up very valid points about the ridiculous regulations you have to deal with but then it seems like you're like you're saying like well that has to be the answer because hemp has nothing and it's like where is the is there somewhere in the middle and is it is it I guess my real question is is it is it only about that accessibility is it only about limited licensing and the economic viability of changing our market, which is what that would be. I mean, frankly, like if we get down to brass tacks, that's what these hempers are proposing. They're saying we couldn't get into the system, right, Scott? We couldn't get in the system. So let's change all the rules and let everybody in, right. you know? And, and I guess there's my, people yeah. like yourself who are like, there shouldn't be, I don't want to say there shouldn't be any rules, but but you're you're on the record of saying, Free to plant. There's no reason we shouldn't be able to grow this and sell it at, at farmers markets and be able to consume. It's a personal liberty kind of thing. And I'm not disagreeing yeah. with the concept, but th that's that's generally not how our country works. You can you can grow all the uh, carrots you want in your backyard, and you can try to sell them at a farmers market. You might have a little trouble depending on the local regulations, um, but you know no one's going to get up in arms about you selling carrots at the farmer's market right. people will get up in arms if you do a home brew and try to sell that at a farmer's market do all the home brewing you want cold drink it on the weekends with your brother-in-law right mm -hmm. it's not going to kill the beer industry it's it's just a hobby thing um but you can't just go sell it you can't put it in the stream of commerce without there being some guardrails and you're right i would have loved to seen the guardrails softened years ago that would have been great it would help a lot of people get into the industry it would make it far far more cost effective to be in the industry because the product price is so high because of all the expenses that go into what we have to do here in illinois we, people are making a normal profit margin if they're making a profit margin at all despite how high the prices are in illinois um and it, it would be great, but it's it's like saying, well, you know, we're halfway through the race. Let's change the rules. Take off the limiter on the carburetors and everyone can just go fast because we have 10 guys going really fast without a limiter. Well, you know, that's, that, and that might be an analogy that a lot of people don't understand, but it, it we are where we are. Yeah. Um, and, and there will be a change. Look, we're not, we're not, I think, so naive to think that this isn't ever going to be descheduled or rescheduled or maybe even made totally legal and 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 those that have that have invested all this money are going to be um in trouble 
And I asked this question. I asked this question of Charlie, Charlie Bechtel from Cresco back in 20, early 2020, right before the pandemic hit, he was speaking at a uh, Chicago um, Society of Chartered Financial Analysts. He was speaking to a bunch of stock analysts, right? And someone asked the question about federal legalization because at least at that point, people were like, oh, as soon as it's fairly legal, you guys are gonna be quadruple billionaires. And, he's, and he and a guy from GTI, they were both like, no, our goal is to, is to build up and make as much money as we can until it fairly legalizes, hopefully have a big enough footprint that someone wants to buy us. Because once that happens, it's going to be Altria or it's going to be, you know, Bush or, or whoever and Amazon doing the delivery by drones. It's, it's going to be a totally different industry. And people like myself and Reese, unless we can build a real brand recognition and, and we're not going to sell our facilities, that's not likely. It's going to be the brand that gets sold if it gets sold. So it's it is really a dark cloud that's out there for most of pe the small people in the industry, I think. And it's it's so and, I and I'll, I'll say this point really quick. I know we're running short on time. Um, you know, there are certain states that did not have limits on license, and there's a lot of folks who lost big time in those states. Illinois had a limit on license, and that impacted those who decided to participate or at least attempt to get a mark, uh, get in the industry there. Because you have to evaluate at some point, how much does it cost to make in, get in the industry and do you attempt to uh, make a profit? Oftentimes, this was talked about as generational wealth. If there's not a limit on license, there is no opportunity for generational wealth, unless, of course, you just build this outstanding brand and you just kill it. That's possible, but it's certainly a lot more challenging. With a limit, limit license, the opportunity is a little bit greater, right? So... You know, it's understanding the rules of the game, if you will, and deciding if you want to invest and play. Well, we did. We got in. We won. And now all of a sudden, again, the rules change. Like, it's, like we need a little more equity and fairness um, for those who are spending a lot just to participate with the desire and hope to achieve that generational wealth that was, I don't want to say promised, but it was um looked at as an opportunity when participating in this industry yeah yeah well said and well i've just got uh three quick points that i'd like to make and then uh give you the floor to close um so uh i just wanted to like totally correct the record because scott you're not completely wrong um but you're, like i want to like kind of add some nuance to my point oh did we lose lose no i'm still uh, here i just gotta plug okay. in no problem. Um, so I would say my like perspective is that, you know, if you're going to sell cannabis commercially, just like kind of you were saying, Scott, if you're going to sell tomatoes commercially or even large scale at farm markets, OK, we're talking like peddler license or some equivalent. But um, I'm going to quote like Ed Rosenthal, I'll share my screen for folks that want to see. I believe the model for cannabis is tomatoes. And I know some people will argue, oh, tomatoes aren't intoxicating. That's not the point. Don't get caught up in that. I'm talking about the market structure. More tomatoes are grown in America by home gardeners than are produced commercially. I want to just repeat that one one more time. One More tomatoes are grown in America by home gardeners than are produced com commercially. Yet there's a robust commercial market for tomatoes, tomato products of all types canned, vine-ripened, organic sauces, soups, ketchup, etc. At the same time, you have small-scale specialty cultivators doing well, selling their produce at farmers' markets, and home gardeners with extra tomatoes sharing their bounty with their neighbors as gifts in trade or through informers, informal sales. Marijuana could be handled in the same way. Commercial growers can thrive by side side-by-side side side with home and specialty cultivators. That's kind of where I stand. It's not that I don't want regulation. It's just that as a cannabis consumer, oh no, we lost Scott. Uh, I think he did say he had to take a call, so maybe he'll be right back. Uh, he he was saying a phone call is coming in. Um, can't as a cannabis consumer though, Reese. I don't know how long you've been consuming cannabis. Oh, Scott's back. Um, I'll try to restate this question here. But as a cannabis consumer, you know, I don't know if you've heard about the federal government spray, spraying Paraquat on cannabis plants back in the day. But, you know, like I'm not again, I'm not saying testing isn't needed, but 
back in the day when we didn't even have testing and the federal government was spraying paraquat on our plants, what we did was we we got to know our grower. And so I'm not saying that, you know, everybody has to find a home grower, but maybe a trusted brand, right? And so that's kind of, I know I, draw, I lost you there for a second, Scott, but uh, to put it shortly, the way I look at it is I think it's, we're on the same page. If you're operating at a commercial level or even a mid-sized commercial level, you should have to comply with licensing and regulations so that there's like, a, I don't want to call it seed to sale, but some sort of a protocol, so, protocol so that you can do recalls and stuff like that, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, sure. Um, and, and, and I don't know, I just, I have trouble with some people really seem scared that like a home gardener is going to affect the market. No. And I just... I just think about tomatoes. You can only get one crop through a year, you know, and then Illinois allows for home grow. I started as a home grower. Yeah, only for med. Card. For, only yeah. for med. Yeah, yeah. I got so. my medical card. It's it's not extremely challenging to get a medical card, and you know, I I still grow now. That fueled my passion to go after this endeavor. Yeah, like, and I still believe that I can grow the best cannabis in the state. Period. <laughs> yeah. Hell yeah. We should. Uh... We should have Indeed. a little competition, maybe. Indeed. Um, so, yeah, sponsor a home grow medical card only home grow competition. Actually, I'm I mean, excited to say that there's uh, something at Molly's Joint, a social equity dispensary. It's called the No Coast Cannabis Cup, and it's supposed to be home growers versus industry, which I think sounds oh, industry. I'm so, all for that. Yeah, I hope to see you there. Apparently, uh, I might be a judge. That's the word on the street. Um, so I've got two more questions for you. Um, and this one is, I, I don't know if you've ever thought about it this way, but since we brought up the spirit of the law, the farm bill, you know, this proposal with hemp, a lot of, you know, I heard Aaron Johnson one time say at a fireside chat that I attended uh, with the Cannabis Business Association of Illinois, that one of the things that law enforcement can't do right now with these hemp shops is go in because it's federally legal, right? And so what if we were to create, I think it was House Bill 4293, that would have given more, uh, let's say, latitude for law enforcement in the state to kind of investigate and see, are these people actually legit, licensed, et cetera? And I guess my question is, you know, people bring up the spirit of the law in the farm bill, but the first sentence of the Cannabis Regulation and Tax Act is in the interest of allowing law enforcement to focus on violent and property crime, the General Assembly finds and declares that the use of cannabis should be legal. So mm -hmm. I feel like it could be argued that giving law enforcement the latitude to focus on anything but that is not in the spirit of the CRTA. What do you say? What do you say? What do you think about that? Well, it's it, cannabis outside of the CRTA is still very much illegal. You're absolutely right. Yeah. You know, and so if if uh, you're growing, you know, 10 acres out in the middle of uh, southern Illinois, you, you're going to get busted. If And it's still very much in law enforcement's interest to make sure that that the illicit market is still challenged appropriately you know not someone growing five plants in their backyard which you know as a kid you could have been pretty darn concerned about right um but um it's still very much illegal at 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 um outside of this outside of this regulatory structure right to your point scott like the cannabis control act of 1978 which originally created the the all the penalties Yep. for cannabis are basically mostly still in effect today. The CRTA Absolutely. just removed the 30 gram possession limit. You right. Know? right. So. And, and I don't know if there've been any cases um, of people having unregulated, having, you know, less than 30 grams of unregulated cannabis, you know, it's just in a baggie. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know if the cops are going after people for that or not. You're, right. Um, I don't think you have to show them your packaging. So I imagine. I think the closest thing I've seen to it personally is like if if somebody is traveling with unregulated cannabis in a vehicle, technically speaking, in a vehicle, there is, a, as you probably know, Scott, there's a yeah. transportation code for the container. So, yeah, right. They'll get right. you there. Well, hey, uh, this last question, and I want to, while I show you this video, I want to ask you the question beforehand because we'll close this out. You know, we talked about social equity. My question to you is, 
what's your definition of social equity? And I'm going to play a, another lawmaker's definition of social equity. So while I play that, uh, I think that's a good note to close on today. So here is uh, Representative Ammons. This is a peek at my upcoming mini documentary. Enjoy. Representative Ammons, what would a truly equitable cannabis program look like to you? I think we would start by fulfilling the promise that was made when you passed legalization in the first place. I think a truly equitable program has to remove all criminal penalties in relationship to the legal substance that you are allowing to be sold and taxed in your state. And so for you to do anything less than that creates the disenfranchisement of certain people in the process. And it certainly does not lend to a truly equitable social equitable program that we sold to the people of Illinois. Thoughts on that definition or if you just want to share your definition uh, either way. Well, very honestly, I'm not quite sure what she said. Um, oh, was my audio bad or? No, 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 no. Okay. It was perfectly fine. Oh, sorry. I thought it I was, messed up the was, share. It was kind of a political speak to me. I mean, the, the, she, she started off with the concept that we're trying to make, um, to, trying to make this industry, which is regulated, you know, um, a catalyst, if you will, my words, for um, for promotion of social equity and social justice. And if we're going to do that, I think she said we truly have to make it available to them. And I think implicit in what that was saying, she was saying, was that that I don't think she was suggesting the system is rigged. I think she might be suggesting that looking, and I don't know when that's from, but looking back on the system and back on how it relate, how it rolled out with all of its faults, it didn't achieve its goals, and probably more work needs to be done to. To, to make sure that the that the that the groups that were thought about when the act was put together not stated in the act there's nothing in the act that goes and talks about certain certain um, parts of society other than disproportionately impacted and it's defined in such a way that you know if I was stupid enough to get busted by weed and my father was still alive as, as wealthy as he might have been, he would have he would have qualified as a as a disproportionately impacted father because his son got busted and he was a veteran. So right. so I think her point was it didn't work. It didn't reach the people that we wanted it to reach. It, it in in as many cases as we wanted it to go to to reach. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll just add my two cents really quick, and I might have just didn't quite because it was kind of seems like to me she was more focused on the. The criminal justice aspect of yes. it, and I could be wrong on that, um, which I totally agree with her. Uh, from my perspective, as it specifically relates to uh, the legal cannabis market, when it's talking about social equity, I think it's talking about a certain degree of fairness. I looked at the medical when I first decided I wanted to kind of get in this process, in this industry. I looked at the only bill that was available at the time, which was the the medical bill, and it's like the cost, the barrier to entry is like maybe like a million plus dollars liquid and a bunch of other, like, that's not fair. That's not equitable. And I think the way they structured the new bill where folks like me could have an opportunity to participate in the market, there was no barrier, no financial barrier that would prohibit me, at least in the law. In no the, express the, one, yeah. No express, right? Um, and I think that's the, in my estimation, that is the, the heart of that equitable component. They want to make sure that folks who are, uh, primarily impacted by these um, unjust laws, have an opportunity to participate in the market that has held us back uh, for so many years and decades, right? So that's that's my view of, of equity, social equity. Yeah. Well, thank you both. And if I could, and I want to, just because I don't want to close, I'd be happy to give you the, path, the last word. My take on the clip was that that we can't claim to address the war on drugs unless we end that war on drugs because like what are we going to do for the future victims just issue another limited number of licenses yeah, right. you know like if we're trying to actually address the cycle why not in the cycle you know um so but again i know that's a bigger conversation so um yeah. well hey scott 
Reese, I want to thank you both not only for sitting down with me, but for reaching out to me um, because, you know, you could have easily just seen that video and been like, fuck him. That's not a nuanced view. And what the hell, what the hell is he, you know, but instead you chose to reach out to me, let me know what you thought about it. And then I was like, you want to come on? Cause I'm an open book. I'm willing to talk about it, play it, go through it. And you were like, absolutely. So I just want to th thank you both for being willing to to do this with me. So. Well, I want to I, thank I, you. I, I want to clarify something I said. I, when I said be stupid enough to get busted, I recognize as a white guy, I'm not targeted. So recognizing that privilege, I'd have to be pretty stupid as a white guy to somehow get to somehow get busted because I'm not targeted. Uh, a lot of people got busted who who just were targeted and got busted. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, and so, yeah I'll, I'll, just, I'll say this this point. First of all, thank you. Uh, for giving us an opportunity to to have this conversation and, and engage in reasonable dialogue. I can tell you, as it relates to criminal justice and what we're trying to do, I wanted to, to secure a license, and I specifically chose a craft grow. I didn't want to do retail because all I'm doing is selling. I wanted to get, an opportun uh, get in a space where we can hire people of color to grow, process, manufacture, and sell to dispensaries legally. I think when you provide these opportunities, I'm less inclined to want to participate in an illicit market that I can run the risk of putting myself and my family in jeopardy, right? And yeah. like on paper, I can tell you what we look like on paper. I can't tell you the reality, but on paper, if everything goes perfect and you do all the things you're supposed to do and you sell all your products in the golden day, you're, you're talking about a $40 million in the middle of the hood, if you will. Right in the middle of a black, I hate saying hood, like in the middle of a black and brown community where I can tell you firsthand, I come from a, a disproportionately impacted community. I see it now. My mother still lives in these communities. And I go back and I see, and I often wonder to myself, why can I offer opportunities where opportunities don't otherwise exist? And this was an industry where I saw was nascent enough where we can get in and really have an impact on our community. And the thing that just pisses me off and drives me nuts when we're finally in a position to provide this opportunity. Many folks in black and brown communities, they don't have a lot of access to disposable incomes, which means you have to find ways to provide for your family. I'm not going to talk about whether it's good or bad, but I know we have, sometimes you got to do what you have to do. Well, how many companies that's generating have the potential to generate $40 million of standing those businesses up in black and brown communities? Right. Right. So when, when we have an opportunity to do that, and it, it just frustrates the hell out of me when the rules change, we've done all the things that we needed to do to stand up, and now the rules change, and everyone wants to say, oh, let's just try to do things fairly and freely. Like That doesn't provide an opportunity for a, a company with this kind of potential to be in the middle of a black and brown hood, to hire folks, and not only with cannabis jobs, transferable skills, right? A cannabis... Craft Grow Company uses accountants and attorneys and every other thing that any other business use that black and brown folks rarely, I don't say ever, but of course, many don't have an opportunity to participate in. It's and a high tech business. It's a high tech business. High tech business and they're transferable skills, yep. right? So it's frustrating for me and I know why I'm in it. I know the reason I got into it and I'm, I'm willing to bet most of the folks um, of color who got into it is in it for the very same reason. We see the challenges, we see the pain that's, that's happening, and we see, yes, it's unfair. And we have an opportunity to, to balance, add some balance, some balance. And when when things threaten that, it, it really frustrates me. So thank you for having, uh, giving us the opportunity to talk about these things and and um, express some of our views as it relates to, to him. Yeah. And I forgot to ask the quick and easiest fun question. How long have you both been smoking weed? Do you feel comfortable answering that question, first of all? Sure. Um, I can't smoke anymore. It kills my lungs. You know, I got borderline C C uh, COPD, mm -hmm. but almost every day in college, for sure. Hell yeah, Scott. Yeah, yeah I, I, I started um, in college and, and uh, I had a pause and then uh, back at it. And I got back into it really at the time in college, I didn't know shit about weed. So I was just smoking whatever came across the desk. And um, as I educated myself and learned more about the product, 
um, my consumption increased because I know uh, different strains and different pro properties and different terpenes and different effects. And, and you can really, you can cultivate the plant in a way that can make you feel the way you want to feel. And mm -hmm. once I kind of learned that, uh, I, I, I love it. Since. Yeah. My, my, my career started and ended at least smoking wise with good old Champaign County ditch weed. So. <laughs> Hell yeah. Champagne <laughs> represent. <laughs> well, sweet. Cool. Nice to end the podcast on a laugh. Yeah. I want to thank you both again for spending thank your you. time with me this afternoon and folks uh, check out the show notes to get connected with Scott and Reese. Uh, thank you, Scott Reese. Take care, everybody. Bye. Thanks.